Oh, let's bang, Tui. Let's freaking bang. Hi, everybody. How are you? Hey, do you know what today is? Well, first of all, it's the 18th of April, 2024. That's the first thing. Uh, how about this? Episode 200. Episode 200 of my live chat. Never thought we would be here, if I could be perfectly honest, because I had to kill it off when I was at MMA fighting. Didn't know if I was going to bring it back. And even when I brought it back, I didn't know if there was going to be anything to it. So uh, here we are, still rocking and rolling. Thank you so much for joining me. I greatly appreciate it. Hey, let me say thanks to a few people here. Uh, I don't know if this is too loud. It looks like it's peaking a little bit. There we go. Thanks to a few folks. Number one, all of you who have watched, all of you who watched everything that I did last week, the uh, the stuff that I did for the uh, UFC 300 watch along post fight. I did a breakdown. Uh, UFC had took a, had to put a copyright claim on it, which I think is unfair. We'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, a lot of people did get a chance to see it. And a lot of people have joined the party. So thank you so much for everyone who took that in. A lot more of that kind of thing coming your way here. Um, so yeah, thanks to Othello for making everything happen. I really appreciate everyone who joined as a member as well. Um, there's a good chance. I, I, it will depend on the time. So I have to look at the time. There's a chance we'll either do a Ryan Garcia weigh in watch along or a PFL watch along one of the two for just members only. I, again, I got to figure out scheduling. I got to figure out time, but uh, that looks like it's a possibility. Um, and we are going to do a watch along and results for Ryan Garcia versus Devin Haney. Probably only co-main and main because the card itself really sucks, but then we'll do the post-fight show thereafter, right? So more coverage coming your way. And then Sunday, we'll have a breakdown for you on Haney Garcia, right? All right, tons of fun stuff. So um, thumbs up if you're watching. I appreciate it. Subscribe if you haven't. It costs you nothing. It's free. Appreciate everyone who has already. Let's do this. We'll go for about an hour on the free questions. I put up a thread ahead of time on the community tab at youtube.com slash Luke Thomas. You guys fill it up. You guys then vote to the top what you want me to get to. And we go for about an hour on that. Afterwards, we'll go to everything in the super chat. So, of course, you're under no obligation to leave a donation. But if you do in the super chat uh, or you're already a member, um, you can then get a question in there in that period of it uh, after about an hour or so. Okay? All right. I got a few more housekeeping notes, but you know how this goes. We got to get this party started. So let's do this thing, shall we? We shall. Okay. One other housekeeping note, if I may. Well, actually, two. Very quickly. You can see right here below on the scroll. If you're listening on the audio platform, you won't hear this. But the scroll has my, or the website, youtube.com slash Luke Thomas slash join. That is where you can become a member. And of course, right now, I'm doing about two of these a week. Sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. But basically, on average, about two um, videos that don't go anywhere else. They go exclusively to members on MMA topics and anything else going on. They don't go to Instagram. They don't go to TikTok. They don't go anywhere. They only live for members. And of course, we're going to do some uh, other live stuff here as well. Um, the question is what to do about some of the breakdowns going forward. So the issue is not whether I think what I do is fair use. I am certain that what I do is fair use, but the way that it works with the YouTube copyright system is that it generally speaking favors the, um, I would say the complainant in this case, but the original rights holder. And you can fight them, but it, it can be a Pyrrhic victory. It can be a costly one if someone else doesn't agree. There's just a lot of ways in which, even if you're in the right, you don't necessarily, it's not always true, but you don't necessarily have all of the leeway that you believe you should have. Um, I'm working on talking to some specialists about this to see what a better sense of my options are. Here's the point I'm trying to make. Boxing stuff, no matter what, I'll, I'll put up here, no problem. And I could always put make things exclusive to members here. Um, as well, which is an option. But the problem with that is that I certainly I want to keep that tier of benefits for everybody. But YouTube takes a hefty, hefty cut of that, whereas Patreon does not. And so part of what I'm thinking about is um, putting some stuff on YouTube, putting all of the boxing. This is we're talking about breakdown stuff, not MMA regular content or UFC regular content or post fight streams. All that stuff will stay here. I'm talking about just the breakdowns. Um, you know, really digging into that significantly more and then making some of that page, some of it Patreon exclusive because they take a significantly smaller cut. And here's the reality, folks, even if, and again, we are talking about this actively, but even if we brought back MK for Fridays, I've been trying to settle into this new schedule that I have and to see like what kind of time I have, what I don't, what my schedule looks like, what it doesn't, right? 
I just have significantly more time now to do that kind of a thing. Like I can, I can vastly ramp that up and um, I can't keep running into the same issues, even if I feel like I'm correct. Now, again, there's a couple of workarounds I'm going to try, um, but the reality is I'm at the mercy of the platform's rules, whether or not they are fair or equitable or not. And so I have to figure out the best way forward. So if you're down for something like that, where there would be a significant ramping up on the UFC side of the breakdowns, again, some of that still would go on YouTube, but there'd be a lot of it that I would make Patreon exclusive. Let me know if that's something you'd be interested in. You can always email me, LukeThomasNews at gmail.com. Um, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. All right. But there's your membership queue, everything else in between. Let's take that off. And then let's get to some of these questions, shall we? Let me make sure everything is good with my guy, Othello. Yeah, everything's good. Okay, great. All right, and Othello did a great job, by the way. Great job. And I also told him I was a little bit mean on Saturday, but it was only because I was very frustrated with, dude, ESPN Plus fucking sucks. People were like, log out of your TV and then sign on here. Guys, I did. Still didn't work. I logged out of my ESPN account there, so I was not signed in at all. And then I logged out, logged back in on my computer, and it was like, oh, yes, you've purchased UFC 300 pay-per-view. Click on it. And then it would reroute me to buy it again. I swear to God that happened. Like, I, I, I'm I, not trying to give you my money. All I'm asking in return is that you function the way that you say you're going to function. I don't think that's a heavy lift. All right. With that out of the way, let's do this. Let's bring in these questions. Like that. Boom. All right, let's refresh, and then we'll go. Okay, question number one. Hey, Luke, with Max Holloway being at the top of the world right now, what would be the evaluation of him if after winning enough rounds on points, he invited Gaethje to trade in the last 10 seconds, and he got knocked out? So that would go down as like an all-time epic mistake, right? If he did something like that, I mean, that would be um, – because remember, he was winning that. I, I thought Gaethje had won the fourth round, and I thought Max had won the first three. And so then the fifth round, I thought Max was winning that one. Max, Remember, Max had kind of stumbled him or semi-rocked him previously in that round. Certainly had landed on him with authority. If then he invites him in and then loses, there might be a rematch. It would really depend. But it would be an all-time an all -time blunder. It's not a blunder in Justin's case because it was actually an invitation for a Hail Mary on his part. Right. Max is like, let's just let's just guns let's just gunfight for the last 10 seconds and then the best man may win. It actually didn't end up in his favor, but that was his best chance of victory. At least that was a very I, I didn't consider that given what prize fighting is as an unreasonable conclusion to make. So um, but yeah, that would be considered an all time blunder, like the worst blunder you could ever make would be that one. It's like you got the shit locked up and you just gave it away in the last 10 seconds and you got viciously KO'd in the process. Yes, that would be considered a, that would be considered one of the worst. I mean, that that's the reality of MMA fighting, right? Like granted he didn't get knocked out, but he was risking it too. You're you're either this close to the immortality of greatness or this close to the immortality of embarrassment. Um there would you know, I'm not saying there's not an in between, there obviously is an in between, but like you can see the two are not far apart. They're not in a situation like that. They're not far apart. Crazy. All right. Okay. Hey, Luke, you've already declared your own prediction for Taporia versus Holloway. Yes. Could you explain how you think that fight plays out? What makes you declare with certainty that Taporia will beat him? I'm not saying he won't. Taporia should be the favorite, but you are very confident. I'm curious to know why. Also, this is easily the top fight to make in the entire sport right now. I think all of us would be in agreement that Taporia versus Holloway is one of the best fights you can make in the sport. Right, not a coincidence that the last biggest fight that I thought you could make in the sport—not biggest uh, in terms of box office, but in terms of like really high level, super interesting fighting—was Taporia versus Volkanovski. I wonder what the common denominator is there. Not just 145, obviously. It's the man from Spain slash Georgia. Um, okay. Guys, Max Holloway is insanely durable. And after a performance like what he had against Justin Gaethje, I'm not saying it wouldn't be close. And I'm not saying that, you know, yes, I'm on, I'm, I'm on the air and I'm feeling it. And I, yes, I am picking Taporia. But I recognize that Max is an elite, elite fighter. It's going to be close. It's going to be difficult. Right. But the reason why I have such faith in Taporia, such as you can call it that, 
is there was a big problem with Justin Gaethje's game plan overall in the way he fought Max. And what was the, what was the, first of all, like many of you, I thought, I said it numerous times on this chat, gun to my head, I thought Gaethje would win, but I did try to articulate some cases for Max that I thought were important. And one was, he, first of all, he dealt with the leg kicks pretty well, but he was able to maneuver around them to a degree on top of it. One of the major problems that I thought Gaethje had in this fight is he did not really, he would try to at times position himself around Max, but he never tried to corral, he never tried to sheepdog him and I or or evade him in any kind of particular way, like constantly stay in one position, or not one position, but constantly stay at a position where he had the advantage. He wasn't ever really, from what I could tell, he was he was not trying to solve for Max's positioning or Max's positioning relative to him in a concerted and consistent way. And so as a result, dude, if Max is free to, did I not say this? If Max is free to roam and he's able to work behind the jab, he's going to be hard to beat. Well, dude, that's exactly what you got. Now, did I think he had the firepower to sleep Gaethje? No, I did not. That part was definitely a surprise. And also kind of tells you how ridiculous um, Dustin Poirier's chin is. I think Max went to lightweight better this time than he did against Poirier, but certainly that's a new wrinkle that he's added. My man is sitting on some punches. And yes, Korean Zombie moving into him, Justin Gaethje, very poor defense when they're both... I mean, they both had poor defense in that last 10 seconds. I don't think anyone's going to say that's great defense. Um, so, you know, you're getting guys wide open with those shots, but even then, like just these one-hitter quitters that he's hitting on people are pretty tremendous. So, um, dude, if... I mean, there's more to the story about what Max was doing. Max, in fact, was solving for a lot of Gaethje's movement. He would get Gaethje moving in one direction, then intercept him. Then he'd get him moving a different direction and get him with the spitting or the turning back kick. Uh, or, you know, he dude, they, they really knew that, dude, it was Max's team. It was Max's team who had Gaethje kind of figured out and his tendencies and understood what the assignment was, constantly getting him to fold and bend and cover, and then putting a series of attacks both in front to elicit that behavior and then behind it. You know, Randy Steinke, you guys know who Randy Steinke is? He's a uh, an instructor out of the, the MMA lab. He's a really smart guy. He made a point once that has really stuck with me. He's like, a lot of fighters get discouraged when they try and set up for something and then they throw. We're talking about this in the standing, not so much on the ground per se, although that may be true there as well. But let's just say standing. He said, fighters will get discouraged, like they'll faint and they'll try something and then they'll jab and they, they, the, someone will cover and block and they'll get out of the way and they get discouraged from that. And he was like, don't do that. When they show you defense, what they're telling you is what the next attack should be based off of that defense, right? In other words, if I flash the jab and you cover up or if I pump the jab and then you cover up and it intercepts your hands, all they're, all they're basically telling you is, yeah, right, next time pump it and then go to the hook. That's what they're telling you. There's it, it, Whatever defense they're giving you, there's going to be some kind of counter to that. So make them show you what the defense is and then build an attack off of that. Dude, Max was doing that the entire time. The entire time. I didn't see a ton of evidence of Gaethje doing that. And so when, you know, Max has got the kind of style where he can build that way and then make reads and make adjustments, but it looked to me, in addition to having that innate in-fight ability, they had scouted around that. And then if you're going to be just engaging, you're going to allow Max to roam and set the tone with his jab, dude. Like, I just didn't think that was going to be the case. I thought he was going to pressure him much more and put him on his heels. And he simply did not. He simply did not. So, um, dude, if Max is allowed to roam, <laughs> you know, and get off on his jab, like, I, I'm not sure what to tell you. I'm really not sure what to say. That's a that's a very 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 winnable fight for him, in under those circumstances. I just didn't think Gaethje would allow it, but he did. Now getting back to Taporia, Taporia doesn't fucking play that game. He is you are very mistaken. Not saying you, I'm saying the proverbial you, very mistaken if you think that Ilya Taporia is going to let Max roam around on him or let him get off on his jab. Now Max is going to have I think. I'm not going to say better cardio per se, but Max has obviously got vastly more deep fight experience than Taporia. About that, there's simply no doubt. Um, but Taporia exceeds him in firepower. Does not exceed him in experience, but it certainly exceeds him in pure in pure firepower as good as what um, 
Max did was Taporia is a harder hitter. I don't think there's really much debate about that. At least there shouldn't be. Uh, he defensively controls. Or I, I would say he's a very he's a much better defensive fighter overall than Gaethje. Um, and solves for positioning relative to the fighter and then positioning relative to the fighter in the cage. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying it to a degree in the per, for the purposes of sort of moving this conversation along a little bit, but, um, dude, Justin didn't do hardly any of that. Taporia will, and Taporia will do it very expertly, right? Taporia did it expertly on Volkanovsky. If you th if you think he can do it to Volkanovsky but can't do it to Max, I'm like, eh. yeah, maybe he won't fold under the the sheer weight of the force that Taporia can deliver in the way that happened to Volk. I mean, maybe maybe it was the previous knockout. You know, again, not many people have the chin of Max Holloway. That's not really a slide on anybody. Uh, so you know, he might be able to endure some of that. But like, I, I just I said this on MK and I'll say it again here. I get that people love Volkanovsky. I love Volkanovsky. I get that people love Holloway. Dude, Holloway is, it has been a joy and an honor. And I, I'm not using those words lightly at all. It has been a joy and an honor to be witnessed to the career of Max Holloway. I mean that sincerely. I mean that as media. I mean that as a fan. Don't you feel that way? Don't you feel like you were lucky? Serious question. Don't you feel like you were lucky to have lived through the era of Max Holloway? Which is, by the way, not even done yet. Like, all of a sudden, just reborn. And even if you lose to Taporia, by the way, still not done yet. Like, we'll get back to that. I feel privileged to have been in this position. Because, like, for example, I feel very unlucky that I missed Muhammad Ali's golden moments. I wasn't alive during that time, right? Um, by the time he was still, I, I was born in uh, late 79, so I'm fucking old. But even then, even, even as old as my bitch ass is, I wasn't old enough to really be a part of that. So I was unlucky, so to speak, in that sense. But I'm not in this one. I'm not in this one. I get to witness this. Guys, my admiration for Max knows no boundaries. But people have decided that they just don't like Ilya Taporia for things he said in the media, for certain reactions he's given, for certain ways he's just been unable to connect with the audience or otherwise been off-putting to them. And I understand that. But that has nothing to do with what the tape shows on this guy. His ability to pressure, cage cut, elicit reactions, make fighters pay, angle off uh, with, with dominant firepower, phenomenal patience, ridiculous timing, footwork that is some of the best in the UFC. Guys, there aren't other fighters as good. There's, excuse me. There's not many fighters, I should say, that are as good as Ilya Taporia. And, and this isn't 35-year-old Justin Gaethje. This guy's, what, 28, 29? We're talking about smack dab in the middle of his prime, and he's only really been hurt one time in his entire career. Different animal, different ball game, not the same one. Is it unwinnable by Max? No, of course not. It's not unwinnable by Max. But there are people who have decided that because they have this reverence for Alex and this reverence for Max, which I share, that that I'm going. They're, they're like, oh, I'm going to surf this feeling, and and now I'm going to believe in these guys because of this feeling that they gave me. This is not how you do accurate pre-fight assessments. And again, Max could win because this is the reality of elite prize fighting. But gun to my head, I, um, you know, I, I don't think there's hardly anybody at 145 right now that can beat Taporia as long as he's not injured and ready. I just I think what he is able to do and the way he's able to control for a fight. And then on top of that, young, hardly any damage, black belt in jiu-jitsu, phenomenal athlete, and has fucking awesome power. That's a tough guy to beat right now. Maybe in a couple of years' time or whatever, you know, circumstances can always change. But right now, that's a very, very, very difficult guy to beat. And, like, because we have warm feelings about Max, and he did something special, too. I don't want to take that away. But this is not 35-year-old Justin Gaethje. As potent a force as that is, that's not who Ilya Taporia is. And I think people are making a very, very big mistake letting their feelings about Max, which I share to the nth degree, impact how they feel about who's going to win. Yeah, I get that a lot of you don't like Taporia. You don't need to learn about how good he is the hard way. He's beaten everyone's favorite fighters, and that's why people don't like him right now, at least, with the, at least in the Volkanovsky case. If he beats Max, I suspect you'll get a lot of that as well. Look at the tape. See what you see. Tell me, tell me what I'm missing. 
All right. Uh, here we go. Luke, do you and BC get the proceeds from the MK store now? We're about to. We're actually working that part out. If the sales actually help you and BC now, I'm sure more people would be interested in purchasing items. Yeah. BC and I were working on new merch yesterday. Literally yesterday. And also taking like uh, part ownership of some of these businesses as well. It's like, again, these things take a little bit of time. But yes, that is actually 100% in motion. What Like fact, matter of factly. Matter of factly. Okay. The cost of entrance music. Wrestling's Tony Khan of AEW recently said he paid upwards of 100 grand to play a song one time only on a pay-per-view for a wrestler's entrance. Yeah, I believe it. Do you know if the UFC have to pay similar figures or do they have a deal in place? Are fighters limited to what songs they can pick? So you guys won't remember this. Back in the day, I've, I've actually discussed this previously. You can look this band up. This was an early 2000s band. I think this is post-Ultimate Fighter, but it could have been pre-Ultimate Fighter. Um, Scars of Life is the name of the band. Just one of these new metal bands from that time that sounds like every other new metal band where they're crying half the time and then screaming the other half of the time. You know, like a shittier version of Avenged Sevenfold, something like that. Um, anyway, they were they were literally for a time they were considered to be the uh, UFC like in house band or in house music, and it, it goes further actually. I think they had another band that they had signed. I could be getting this name wrong, but it was something like Black River Flood or something along those lines. But there was a time when the UFC, I think when they were trying to save money, again, this is like pre, slightly pre, slightly post, like around the UFC 40s or so, UFC 50s or so, they actually had their own record label. And they were signing either bands to the record label or um, purchasing song rights through the label that they could play or otherwise own or something like that. But they definitely had their own record label because what you're describing is very, very true. And in fact, um, just the other day, I was actually rewatching some old BJ Penn fights. And, you know, dude, Max has like on, with uh, the, uh, who's it, Mokey Boy, the the uh, Hawaiian kickboxer entrance. But, dude, the original like Hawaiian entrance, and I still think it's actually the best entrance of any Hawaiian fighter ever. You know, Ilema Ile Ile McFarland's presentation was cool, but... Max coming out, and I can't even say the guy's whole name, but he's called Brother. He's, his name is like Israel Kawaka Moli. It's like this long. I, I'm, I'm saying it poorly. Please forgive me, um, um, Pacific Islanders. But uh, it's this long last name, and they call him Brother. Ease. And it was uh, his song. Dude, that used to be the most haunting shit you ever heard in your life. When he would come out, and th when this was this guy was sort of widely considered to be the best in the world, it would, it would send shivers up your fucking spine to watch something like this. And then when I rewatched it, they've they you can still obviously hear Rogan and Goldberg doing commentary and stuff like that, but they've kind of they've just got generic music over it. And I saw like when I, I rewatched the Jorge Masvidal and Benson Henderson fight that was in Korea, and they both dubbed over all of their music as well because holding on to the rights to play that stuff can be very, very, very expensive. I don't quite understand why the business works in that way. I don't, I don't get why they can make no money on streaming and then for applications like this, record labels can charge extraordinary sums. I don't, I don't understand why that is, but that it is, that case is true. My wife, for example, again, um, she's a corporate event planner, and so to the extent that she's planning conventions and whatnot for various corporate entities, they have to go through all of these things and like apply for rights to use stuff, and sometimes it gets approved by these various record labels. Sometimes it doesn't. It can be extremely costly. I don't think a hundred thousand is always what it costs. That can I, I believe there's some there's certainly some variance in that, but you know, and significantly less. I think it's I've seen cases where it was like ten to fifteen thousand, but not cheap. You know, certainly not cheap. But yeah, that's a real thing that goes into um, potential event event costs and again i don't understand that world enough to know why the business model works that way but it does it certainly does okay aljo looked pretty good at 45 how do you think he'd perform against other heavy grapplers in the division like movsar uh of low ever and i know that's not how you say it of I, I, I don't know how you say it properly um dude i'll tell you what i tell you what i went back and i watched that aljo and cater fight Here's the thing. He didn't, I think it was only him and Andrade who didn't get a post fight interview. Obviously, he didn't get a bonus, I'm imagining either. Uh, didn't exactly put on the most memorable performance that would go to Holloway or Pereira or, you know, someone along those lines. So 
did he put on the kind of performance that earned him the mandate to call for a title shot at 145? No. However, putting that aside for just a moment, just the skill level and then the fighting ability that he showed against a very credentialed, good fighter in this weight class, dude, he, Aljo looked pretty good. You know what I mean? Like, I saw that and I was like, okay, he's not going to get a title shot next, but uh, he's going to be a tough fight for just about anybody. Just about anybody. The Movsar one is interesting because I don't quite, I have to think about more how they, you know, Movsar might want to keep that one on the feet and then pressure him or get on top or, you know, be the one who's trying to wrestle with him so that he can just make him sort of have to put his hands on the mat and, you know, work from outside of his hips or whatever. That's a possibility. I doubt that he would play too much guard, but, you know, you never know. He might play some guard, um, uh, Aljo. So that'd be kind of, that'd be an interesting fight. I, 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 I'm I not exactly sure how that would go. I'd have to do a little bit more tape study, but that that is an interesting one. The other one you, meant, you didn't mention, but comes to mind is like, what about Aljo versus Brian Ortega? I'm going to guess Aljo is either going to Aljo is going to want in those cases to stick and move on the outside, and then when he does shoot, you know, like a duck under, find the back, and then see if he can hold it, or you know, maybe just put Brian Ortega in half guard or something, like some kind of relatively neutral-ish position, long enough to avoid sub, stand up, and then kind of repeat this whole cycle uh, again. That to me seems like a, 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 a fights by the way he could win both of them I, I might even favor him to win the fight against Ortega depending depending but my takeaway from that was okay he didn't walk out of this event as people as someone that fans had spotlighted as like that guy did so well at this event we got to see what's next he didn't he didn't capture the fan base's imagination in that way but the skill level he showed the physicality like power bombing cater that he showed the relentlessness that he had in terms of his cardiovascular conditioning again i thought he'd be in good shape but you just you know it's a it's a different weight class how's it going to look on him it looked pretty good it looked pretty good i didn't get like super dominant inevitable threat but i got a very serious threat vibe from him no doubt about it so he's going to have to do a little bit more to get the title shot that he wants that's just the fight game I wouldn't rule out a title. I, I wasn't sure what I was going to make at 145. I just didn't know. And now I'm like, okay, I don't know if a title shot is inevitable, but it might be probable. Might be probable. He 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 fought quite well. He looked really good. Wow, good question. Two good questions. Has Max now surpassed BJ Penn as the greatest Hawaiian fighter of all time? Also, have you watched Shogun yet? Okay. Let me go with the second one first. Yeah, I watched the first three episodes of Shogun. Dude, that show fucking rules. Y'all were right. I'm blown away at how good that that show is. Now, again, I, I've not seen the rest. I don't know how the rest of it goes. I, I, I will have to see. But through the first three, oh my God. Like, the actors they got seem really good. The costume design is out of control. The set design is pretty good. The way it's shot is pretty good. Um, I thought there'd be a lot of English that the Japanese actors were forced to speak. No, they they speak Japanese to each other, which, I, again, you don't really understand someone until you hear them speak their native language in their native way. It's fucking great. So maybe the show falls off from here. I don't really know, but uh, it seemed pretty fucking great to me, from what I can tell. Now, has Max surpassed BJ Penn as the greatest Hawaiian fighter of all time? That's a tough one. They just have such radically different careers in different times of the sport. First of all, BJ Penn's losing streak at the end of his career does significant damage to him. I don't, I don't see how it doesn't. Like it doesn't undo the good things that he did, but it adds to the good things he did with a lot of bad. That just makes his resume messy. He jumped weight classes where he was fighting Lodo, the Lodo Machida, like what heavyweight, light heavyweight. I forget what the exact weight was at this time, but you know, fighting him well outside of his weight class, and then beating all the Gracies at the time he did when that was still a really important achievement, and beating Henzo and whatnot, like. They just—he was just doing a lot of different things, being the fuck out of Takanori Gomi at Rumble on the Rock. I don't think people understand how big of a fight that was. That was a really big fight, um, and so you know he just lived at a different time. Like I don't know if we were doing pound for pound rankings when he fought Diego at what was that one oh seven something like that. 
but like there was a it was widely considered at that time that he was like maybe pound for pound number one or at a bare minimum like the best that lightweight's ever seen and so you know when you compare max in those sort of broad strokes is he the best featherweight we've ever seen he's one of them for sure um and he won a bmf title which bj probably would have won if there had been one at that time or he went up to 170 and he won a title up there too so you know bj won titles in two different weight classes two weight class titles but he did it at an era where their fight was when, he, when did he beat matt hughes 2004 before going to k1 some something stupid like that so it's just two radically different eras i was thinking about this today like prime bj pan versus prime max holloway like they fought at their very best it's weird if bj were to get it to the ground i have a feeling he could win and even on the feet he's not outmatched like i think he's got more pure firepower than max and now that might sound crazy to some of you but bj could fucking thump back in the day make no mistake about it but i think max's jab and cage and, and, and lateral movement and overall striking ability would give bj fits over the course of time i i really do like if he could keep it standing there's no doubt in my mind Holloway could win that one. I mean, he got if he got hit with a big shot, maybe not, but on the feet, I could, I could, I could. Like in terms of what Holloway did to Gaethje through four rounds, or you know, four and a half, or four and whatever it is, nine tenths, basically. I could see him doing that to Penn. I really could. Penn had slicker boxing and had again just real firepower, good offensive wrestling, good defensive wrestling. So if like BJ really wanted to make it a wrestling match or a grappling match. I think that changes the equation. It, but if they kept it striking, I'd probably favor Max in that regard. So they just lived in wildly different eras, and the signposts of what counted as the best were different. But you know what Max has turned in in the broader scope of his career, like he's had more. I'll say this for Max: he's had more success for much longer. BJ had like he he burned very brightly for a little while, and then had some ups and downs. But you know for the most part, burned very brightly and then kind of flamed out. Max has kind of kept a flame lit the entire time. And I, 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 you know, I, I, it's weird. BJ's ultimate highest achievements have the have been the kind of thing that have eluded Max, but the kind of consistent elite ability that Max has shown clearly outpaces what BJ Penn had to offer. Um, but, you know, remember, BJ Penn, first American to win the Jiu-Jitsu World Championships at the black belt level. Like, when they called him the prodigy, that was that was truth in advertising. Again, he flamed out, but that was 100%. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Here's my coaster. Ready? Um, he flamed out, you know. All right, all right, all right. Let's get it. Uh, Luke, you have been an awesome companion. Oh, this is a nice one. You've been an awesome companion through this week through 3 UFC 300. I know you missed the family. Thank you so much. Yes, I very much miss my family. I talk to them several times a day, and I am very sad that I cannot be there with them. Um, but um, there's work to be done. There's work to be done, unfortunately. So uh, hopefully I don't have to do this any again anytime soon. All right. Okay. What do you think about Alex, talking about Pareda, getting a BJJ black belt or black belt in BJJ after nine years of MMA with no subs or takedowns and without competing in grappling competition. He was able to defensively grapple Jan just enough. I doubt he would be able to use that part to of, of MMA to defeat uh, Ankalaya of Aspinall or Jones. Aspinall spelled wrong. Glover knows that world all too well, but I can't help but raise an eyebrow. Your thoughts? I mean, it's weird to give it to him in a fight where there's no wrestling or jujitsu at all, right? And he just clubs him with a left hook and then finishes him off with hammer fist. Like, don't get me wrong. It's a hell of a win. It's a hell of a win. But I was like, I didn't get it. Okay. Not going to competition means nothing. Um, the reality is the vast majority, like a lot of people who do jujitsu do competitions, but the vast majority of people who do jujitsu don't do competitions. That's, that's going to be your reality. Number one. Uh, number two, I have I have been to places where they had a bunch of people you've never heard of, purple belts and above, who were all fucking murderers who didn't who didn't compete or just didn't, didn't compete very often. Like it's not a thing. It, it, so, Seth Smith of Upstream BJJ, who's a black belt under Ryan Hall, has told me many many times, years and years ago, years ago. 
if you want to get better faster, going to competition is always going to be better. It's going to facilitate the learning process, both what works, what doesn't, um, how to apply your game, any number of factors. And so if you want to get better, you can do that. But not a lot of people either have the time or interest for it. The fact that Alex has never competed in a grappling competition means zero. Okay. I'm not saying it's not. Again, I'm not saying he couldn't have got there faster or that it can't be beneficial, but that he didn't is not disqualifying. That's the first thing. The second thing I'd say, uh, well, it's kind of two things, but the th other thing I would say is, you're right. Relative to this fight, I don't understand giving it to him. Maybe they had planned on giving it to him no matter what, and because he won, they just felt it was the appropriate time. A lot of people assume that if you get a win in the UFC and then you get your black belt afterwards, it came as a result of the way in which you won. Like, for example, do you guys remember when Tyron Woodley, uh, did he ultimately Darce choke? Uh, Darren Till, whatever it was, how, whatever the finish was, I think it was a sub that way. Dean Thomas pulled out the black belt and gave it to him. Guys, he had the black belt in his bag, right? Like there was clearly a. I mean, they don't just walk around with black belts and like, well, is, is now the, is now the time? Like, are we going to do this now? You know, it's not. It's not really the way that it works. They 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 had clearly this is something they had thought about. This was some, something that they had planned. Um, and then he wins the fight. I think again, I think his case was like Darce or Anaconda, something like that. And uh, and they give it to him there. This was a case where they clearly had thought about giving it to him, and he wins without any jujitsu. So, like, just because he won without jujitsu doesn't mean they weren't already planning to give it to him. They just didn't give it to him in this immediate, more central jujitsu context. Now, that being said, I have no idea if he's actually deserving of a black belt. Glover is a real one. He would know better than you or I. Certainly, we don't have a ton of evidence uh, one way or the other to make an assessment about his jiu-jitsu game. And again, your MMA jiu-jitsu can sometimes be a far cry from your sport jiu-jitsu. A belt is typically, I mean, that's part of the gi system. I'm not saying he's always wearing a gi, but it's a, it's a, there's no, there's no such thing as like MMA jiu-jitsu as its own coherent discipline where schools open up, oh, we only do MMA jiu-jitsu here. Well, that's just MMA. You might have a focus on jiu-jitsu, but there's no belt system for MMA jiu-jitsu. There's a belt system for sport jiu-jitsu or traditional jiu-jitsu, right? That, ha that may have overlap with MMA, but it's not the same thing. So like just because he hasn't gotten a lot of subs or doesn't look like he's necessarily intent or very even capable of using some of his jujitsu in MMA. Again, you got to be careful what that means in the more sporting context of it, um, which this could, this could have been just the perfect celebration moment. He just had a huge win in the main event of UFC 300 fucking give him his black belt. Like it could be just that. And, and there's nothing really more to it than that. So it's one of those things where we don't know. It may have very little to do with his MMA game. It may have very little to do with the way that he actually fought or with the way the fight went anyway and could just be a celebration and an award of something he has earned strictly in the gym. That happens all the time. And uh, it would be, you know, the way that would normally work if he wasn't a prize fighter is the next time he came to class and they were doing promotions, they would have promoted him to black belt. That's how that would have gone. But he's also a prize fighter and he won in the main event of UFC 300. Under those circumstances, I sort of get it, you know. With the way Max moved on the outside and stayed at range, do you think his footwork could prevent him from being corralled by Ilya behind the black line? What other strategies would Max need to implement in an Ilya matchup? Thanks. I have to think about that. He uses that front kick a lot, that push kick. I think a kicking game more generally. Um, do I think, your question was, the way Max moved on the outside and stayed at range, do you think his footwork could help him prevent him from being corralled by Ilya behind the black line? Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, even Ilya, it took him some time to get to the part where he needed to get. So, like, there's no doubt in my mind Max is going to make that tough. But then the question is, do you think Ilya can solve for that? And I do. I do think Ilya can solve for that. Um, what would Max need to implement in an Ilya matchup? Um, I think he would need to pressure Ilya, to be perfectly honest. Like, he's really... Dude, if you're not dictating space, if you're not dictating range... Uh, you know, again, Ilya could take the Volkanovsky thing where he just circles off away from the jab and takes that away. But that's a, I don't know if he wants to fight that way. My hunch is that dude, like Ilya, 
Ilya is a big real estate guy. Like he wants to be the one dictating the terms of the fight in terms of its physical look, your proximity to him and then your proximity to various points around the cage. He wants to be the guy who is dictating that. You have to take that away from him. Uh, you, you, there's various ways you could do something like that, but that is sort of the central order here. If I'm Max, um, putting pressure on that guy, and e easier said than done. With a fucking hammer like that, who can also move? That's a tough. That's a tough. I mean, can Max do it? Yes, yes. But this is what I mean about degrees of probability. If he is the one on the back foot consistently, uh, and you know uh, he's draw, and Ilya is drawing out his jab and then reacting off of it. That's tough. That's going to be a tough fight to win. That's going to be a very, very difficult contest. But I need to do a lot of tape study on that one because that one seems like it's going to be a ton of fun if, if and when they make it. Curious to hear your take. If Max Holloway were to beat Ilya, okay, do you think Sean O'Malley would still be interested in moving up to featherweight? Ooh. And if that matchup did happen, how do you envision the fight between O'Malley and Holloway playing out? Damn, I hadn't even thought about anything like that. All right, so if Max beats Taporia, well, if Max beats Taporia, I mean, he's going to have to see him again, probably, right? You're like, well, Volk may not see him right again. I, 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 yeah, I don't know how that's going to go. Um, but okay, would Sean O'Malley still want to fight Max Holloway? I'm guessing... Oh, that I haven't even thought about that. Jesus. What is Sean O'Malley's... Ooh, fuck me. What is Sean O'Malley's reach? Let's see. Sean O'Malley's reach is 72 inches. That's a, a slightly more, I believe, than Max Holloway. Slightly more. Let me see here. Max Holloway is currently... Measured reach 69 inches. Yeah, he'd have a reach advantage. Again, uh, Max could make that a wrestling contest like he did against Yair, and that could mix it up. I think Max's ability to resist the firepower would be significant. I mean, Max can take the hardest hitters two weight classes up. That would be tough for Sean O'Malley. Max's, I think, leg kicking game was, you saw a little bit of trace of it. I think that could potentially do him a lot of good. I think Max's size and firepower and um, and potential wrestling game would be a little bit too much for Sean O'Malley. Sean O'Malley, obviously, he's got great accuracy, great speed, pretty good power. He's got some good pop. Uh, a lot of what he does, though, is sort of based on if he can't sleep the guy initially, it's a lot of deterrence-based uh, striking where you are, you know, you begin to second guess, you begin to question, and therefore you begin to make trade-offs about how you're competing to make yourself less exposed and i just don't think max would succumb to something like that not so easily but that's a crazy that's an interesting fight i, I hadn't really thought much about something like that but that that could be but that's a very interesting kind of conversation all right what did you see in Max's game? I've kind of been over this. Max's game plan slash approach to the fight. I noticed when he was circling that Justin wasn't able to leg kick him, but Max wouldn't commit to circling at times standing in front of Justin, and that's when he Max would eat a leg kick. Yes, Max trying to draw out reactions and circumstances like that. Also, it seemed... Oh, here we go. Also, it... Here we go. It seemed like Max was trying... Here we go. Trying to bait out extended combos. Yes. So he could avoid the first couple of punches, then step back into punch Justin's second, third, and fourth punch. Yes, especially when the guy covers and bends over. one hundred, And then you can angle off of him, 100%. Trevor picked up on this and asked Justin to stick to two-punch combos and then get out of the way. Yes, in the past, people would counter off Justin's naked singular leg kicks, but Max seemed to ignore that in preference of interrupting extended punch combos. Uh, why do you think Max opted for the back kick to counter Justin's habit of ducking when rolling instead of the knee? Does it keep Max's head out of, the, uh, out of counter distance? That's partly it. I don't think there's any concerns about back exposure where you're like, fix, for example, where you're Alexa Grasso fighting Valentina Shevchenko and then they were waiting for the back. They're, you just Justin's really not going to fight you on those terms, so there's less about it. You can do uh, a lot to land with it. You can steer. You can do it both when they're moving laterally and when they're moving in a straight line. He was able to do it from either stance. 
depending on what they were doing. Again, moving back in a straight line or moving laterally to intercept. So it's powerful. It's comfortable. He can do it from either stance. He can do it when they're when they're moving. He can do it when they're backing up straight. There's just a lot of it's it's just a strike that he likes that he's been easy to integrate. It's he doesn't really telegraph it too much. And there's a ton of value. I think that's probably why he went with it. You're, this is a very good assessment on your part. Uh, Max seemed to ignore that in preference of inter the extended punch combos. Yeah, dude, Max is going to take one, not to give one, but to give two or potentially three. That's a very common thing you see with him where he'll sit in that very dangerous mid-range, not outside or super inside, but right at the mid-range, and he'll inv invite attacks. He'll invite responses, and then he'll really just sort of bite down on the mouthpiece and fire something back. Um, that's very, very common. A lot of times body head shots a lot of times four to five punch combos a lot of times pushing someone into a place where then he can stutter and then go again have you noticed that well he'll do a, like a bop 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 they back up they think the pressure is off and then he charges again right after that so he's got this kind of delayed timed blitz right there's just a lot about all of that that really works for his kind of game he likes to really keep people not I mean, everyone likes to keep people guessing, but really at the end of these like on these like onslaughts, these waves of offense that he puts on people. Again, uh, and why do you think Max opted for the back kick to counter Justin's habit of ducking okay, instead of going for the knee? So if you're going for the knee, I mean, part of it is um, the back kick. Again, I just think it's something he likes and it's versatile. The knee also just brings you very close to somebody, right? And if it doesn't land, I mean, if it does land, that's great. If it doesn't land uh, or they time it, they can catch it and they can dump you. Um, he could, Justin has very good dirty boxing. He'll collar tie and then slam a shot home. You you avoid all of that. With a spinning back kick, if it lands, you can, by the way, it broke his nose, obviously, so it was a great call there. But you can push someone in either past the, the black line or onto the fence line itself. And so it gives you superior cage positioning. So it's not to say that there couldn't be an, an argument for the knee. Um, I get that, but if you're trying to make a trade-off between, I don't want to get too close to a guy, I don't want to let him put his hands on me if I don't have to, I want to be able to touch and go, or I want to be able to move somebody around or intercept them, the knee can do some of those things, but for Max, it probably came with a little bit more trade-off, and the, the, the back kick didn't. It came with a ton of upside, either stance, left or right, straight lines coming or going like it just it was really really very very powerful for him so it's not to say that the next guy you might be like oh they're able to use the knee and you're like well, why didn't someone else do that maybe the knee is more comfortable for them maybe they didn't mind ending up in a range where they're now they're right next to each other but it seemed like max wanted to keep things in that mid-range but not super close range if the back kick does a lot more for you than the knee would under those considerations How would Alex do against the top five at heavyweight? All right, I don't even know who the top five at heavyweight is, so let's see. Who is the top five at heavyweight? All right, let's see who we got. Top five at heavyweight is all right. So John Jones. I don't. I, I would pick Jones to win. I don't. I don't think that's super crazy. All right, we're looking right here. These are the ones we're looking at. So there's Tom Aspinall. You know, like I said on MK, do I think he'd beat Tom Aspinall? I don't. But would I mind? The fight happening at all, I would not mind it happening fucking at all. Make that fight. That would be fantastic. Cyril Ghosn, that's an interesting fight. I think Ghosn would be harder to hit and harder to find, but might be able to stick and move. That's a hell of a fight, actually, now that I think about it. Alex Pereira versus Cyril Ghosn. Well, I got to tell you, I hadn't thought about much about that one. Alex Pereira versus Cyril Ghosn. I'd have to think about that one a little bit more. That's a hell of a fight, right? That's a fun one. Wow. Okay. Sergey Pavlovich. Alex Pereira versus Sergey Pavlovich. Do you hate that fight? I don't hate that fight. I don't hate that fight at all. I could see Pavlovich with the bigger power really, you know, laying the lumber. Um, that'd be a. a <laughs> the Gone one seems a little bit harder because he'd be a little bit harder to find. Gone's got real good distance management. He doesn't at least in the stand-up, tends to make less bad decisions. The Pavlovich one is interesting because Pavlovich is just going to, you know, uh, and he's got big power, probably bigger than uh, Alex just because he's naturally big for the weight class. But that's an interesting one too. 
I'd, lo- I'd, I'd love to see that one. Okay. Um, Steve Miocic, you're never going to see it, so who cares? Curtis Blades. See, the Blades one is interesting, right? Because Blades, you could see Blades taking him down and then just with savage ground and pound, tearing him up. Or you could see Blades making a bad decision on the feet and getting viciously KO'd. So that's a fun one as well. And then the last would be Volkov. Dude, there's a bunch of those fights you could make that I'd be psyched to see. Now, I don't know if Poetan wants them if there's no belt on the line, but just to see if he could win some of those. I'd be curious as hell to see something like that. That'd be great. That'd be great. Uh, we kind of got to this one earlier. Prime BJ versus Max at 55. Who wins and why? I might favor Max in that one. You know, At the time in which BJ was doing it, he was the best that I had ever seen. And his again, his power and his jiu-jitsu were so otherworldly, he went up a different weight class, and he got the title in the second weight class and was doing other things against, you know, so many different kinds of fighters. He did incredible shit, but just to straight up in terms of like who they are at lightweights and their peak ability, I might have to give it to Max. I might have to give it to Max. Luke, I don't feel Aljo gets enough credit for his stance switching ability. Okay, let me read this one. In rewatching his fights, he does it almost effortlessly. Even more seasoned strikers like Whitaker haven't shown that ability. Why does that never get talked about when or you think? How do, and how do you see the fight with him and Ortega possibly playing out? Man, the Ortega one is... I could kind of discuss that one a little bit. Why doesn't he get credit for stance switching ability? Probably because... Um, I'd have to look at how he uses it more closely. But his seems to... Okay, so I'm not saying he doesn't use it off... Again, I, I need to double check. I need to double check. I'm not saying he doesn't use it offensively, but it's not like he uses it like Poirier where he might use shifting, which is another way of saying stance switching, through forward-moving striking combination, especially like just with hands, you know, where he's really trying to put it on a guy. His, to me, seems more of like misdirection, confused look, hard to know what's coming, not so much to create a really offensive, dynamic moment. That may not necessarily be fair. Again, I need to double check on the tape. But you think about guys who, like, for example, like TJ Dillashaw in his prime were using stance switching. He would do it to set up like a, a fight ending head kick potentially or something very devastating. So you you tie the outcome of what happens in that moment to the stance switching itself. And you're like, oh, that guy's a really good stance switcher. Like Boots Ennis in boxing can fight from either stance and hold switch stances through fights in any number of ways and then catch these guys that they in ways they never expect and you're like oh right this fucking guy can do all this incredible stuff you tie it to that whereas it seems to me um and again need to double check aljo stance switching is good and it is valuable like there's a reason why he does it and there's a reason why he incorporates it into his game because it has a very strong utility for him you can't lose sight of that I just don't think there's a lot of highlights that show us it leads to these like devastating outcomes uh, as a consequence. It's very successful for him, but it's a lot of misdirection and setup versus this is my this is my entryway into lowering the boom on a guy, you know. This is interesting. Luke, based on where they are ranked, does Gamrot versus Oliveira make sense next? And how would you see that playing out? Okay, again, I don't know where they're ranked. So let's see. Where are they ranked? Right here. So you got Gamrot at five, Dariush at six. They already fought. Chandler at seven. He's busy. And then Gamrot at... F- Where's Oliveira at? At two. Um, yeah. Given who's available and whatnot, yeah, you could do that. You could do that. The Fazeev and Oliveira one, I, I kind of like a little bit more, to be honest with you. But, yes, you could do that. That's an interesting one. Um, Gamrot and Oliveira. That's a tough fight for Gamrot. I feel like he's obviously going to be better at the wrestling. And he might have... It's going to be. You know what it's going to be? That's going to be one of those fights where he's going to just smother... Oliveira, my wife sending me a video from their vacation. I call it their vacation because it sure as fuck ain't mine. Um, 
All right. Gamrot's going to try and smother him on the ground. He's going to try and maintain close chest. At this point, you saw Saryuki do it, and you've seen Makachev do it. And to an extent, Dariush do it as well. Dariush also, I went through this, kind of solved for the leg entanglements and whatnot, but you can see that there's a game plan now with that. So you would see some of that. The question is, to what extent he would get rewarded for effective grappling if he can't really get any meaningful ground and pound going on the feet, how much he would get chewed up before going for the takedown. I, I, it's a tough fight for him to win. It's hard for him to win a fight on control, which that is what he would probably be better at against a guy who's going to relent to control, but is going to be much more offensively dynamic. That's a control versus offense kind of game, and especially if it was five rounds. You just, you know, or I should say, especially, well, if it's three hard. I, yeah, I'd fit, especially if it's five rounds, it's going to be tough for him to have the requisite offense he's going to need. Um, I think to get over the hump. I mean, the instant he starts opening up, there's just going to be a scramble. And I don't think he's going to open up very often. And so you're just like, what was the offense there? That's, that's a big problem in his career more generally. And I think because Oliveira is so potent, um, you would just see a lot of evidence of that. This is an interesting one. There's good questions today. Look, I noticed I'm listening to a lot less new music. Okay. I used to always check out the New Music Fridays on Spotify and check out what was new, whether it was from artists I knew or not. Now I'm 25, and I realize lately I don't really listen to much new music or seek it out. I'm curious if you remember ever feeling this way at a certain point. Buddy, welcome to the rest of your life. <laughs> welcome to the rest of your life. I didn't understand this when I was young. No one really explained this to me when I was young, but it's true. Ready? Here it goes. It's not to say that you won't encounter new music through the rest of your life that you may like. That's not what I am saying. What I am saying is that the music that will define your tastes probably for the rest of your life and the music that you will continue to listen to throughout the rest of your life is the music of your youth. Now, 25, you're still pretty young, but this happened to me around 30 or so, a little bit later, maybe right around when I got married, 32. No one tells you that. No one told me that. They're always like, oh, this new music. Rah, rah, rah. And you think, oh, they don't like it because they're just old and don't get it. What they didn't tell you was you will be old and not get it too. Like I listen to this the modern day rap. I cannot possibly imagine who the fuck could be interested in something like that. But it doesn't matter because it's not made for me and my opinion on it doesn't count. And I understand that. Fully get it. I'm not the audience. It's not my generation. I don't have any say over it. Even if I did, no one would care. You have to accept the world on those terms, when it comes, especially when it comes to art. The music that will, in many ways, drive what you listen to the rest of your life and, and, and what you will continue to listen to the rest of your life is the music of your youth, period. That is how it will go. Everyone I know who is my age has had the exact same experience with a couple different, you know, you might know a few people who are like real music nerds who are constantly looking for new stuff and that continue to evolve their tastes. There's people like that. But for the majority of us, the music you like is the soundtrack of your youth. That's it. Luke, do you believe that Turner dropping Moicano and opting to not follow up on him could have been some sort of subconscious response following what he had done to Bobby Green in his previous fight. I have wondered this. What a great question. We've seen fighters walk off prematurely before, but even after Moicano was on his feet, it seemed Turner pled with the ref to stop it. Maybe I'm just reading into, uh, into it too much. Thanks for the content. I have thought about this too. Without talking to Jalen Turner, I am speculating just as much as you. I wonder if it played a role as well. That was one of my thoughts too. Maybe not in real time, but afterwards I was like, you know what? After what that guy just saw in his last fight, he probably thought, you know what? I don't want to do this. At the same time, what I will also say is Jalen Turner is enormously talented and I don't think has really kind of settled into his... He's one of these kids that I was like, or guys, I should say. He's one of these guys that... He's such a talented fighter. But certain fighters, this is just going to come naturally, are going to be better decision makers or at a bare minimum, less naturally prone to error. And I would feel like he's a little bit prone to error. There are times in which he makes calculations, not just in this fight, but in other ones, 
he makes decisions that I sometimes really don't understand. He's a guy to me that would have developed. Um, it's not like he can't beat good guys in the UFC now. He certainly can. He would have benefited to me from a little bit of a longer time spent on the regional scene, working out some of these details, and he's learning on the job in real time. I still think he has a very bright, very bright future. Uh, but if I was him, I would dial back some of the competition and really begin to work work on how I operate through a round, scenario-driven training. You know, he's got firepower. He's got amazing timing. You know, for example, what did I tell you guys previously in the chat, right, from Randy Steinke? When they block or show you defense or something, you don't get discouraged. You use that to know what the solution is to solve the problem. If they cover here, you go to the hook. If they cover here, you go to the straight. I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but these would be basic diagnoses you could make. Jalen Turner's very good at that. For example, in the Bobby Green fight, did you notice how he got him? Bobby Green kept ducking to the same side, ducking to the same side, ducking to the same side. So he double jabbed, double jabbed which got him closer. Sure enough, the first jab, what did it do to Bobby Green? Had him ducking to the same side. So he doubled up on the jab to get him closer and then fired the cross down to his position knowing he would be there. It's similar to what happened in the um, Boots Ennis and Custio. I think it was a Custio Clayton who he fought. See that here real quick. Let me. Which fight was that for Jerron Ennis? Yeah, the Custio Clayton fight knocks him out in the second round. You can see this fight if you guys have never seen this. Here, let me show. It. Well, I can't show you the. the I mean, you know what? Actually, I can uh, show you that fight. Hold on. Let's do this. Jerron Ennis, Custio Clayton. This one. Oops, I don't want to. I don't want to hover over it. It's this one, the top one. NS versus Clayton, full fight. Okay, that's the one you want. NS versus Clayton, full fight. And um, go watch that. It's the same thing. Doubles up on the jab because the first reaction is the one that gets him to duck, and it's the second one, bah, that he crushes him with. He set that whole thing up. He set that whole thing up. Really, really fantastic work. So he can do all of that stuff, but then he gets to these kinds of moments and he begins to make decisions that you're just not sure where they come from. This one could be somewhat unique to the way you're describing the previous incident that he had in the Bobby Green fight. But I, I, again, I would still say there's been a few of these decisions that he's made over the course of his career that have been somewhat questionable. So to me, he's got serious, serious potential. Um, but it looks to me like the development process that he could benefit from is not over. And I, if I were training him, and I'm not, but if I were, I would focus on that. All right, we'll get... Uh, who has a better chance of beating Ilya, Sugar Sean or Max Holloway? Probably Max Holloway. Luke, if they do, in fact, end up doing Max versus Ilya towards the end of the year, do you think Volk just waits for the winner? Or should he fight someone else? Maybe an Aljo who's not a hard puncher and a former champion? Man. Volk versus Aljo. That's a hell of a fight. Mm. Volk versus Aljo. Do you take that fight? If I'm Volk, I wait. I wait. Two knockouts in a row, I wait. You don't want to wait forever, but I wait. Um, I don't know what he wants to do because he's getting older, so he may not want to do that. Whew, man, that's a risky fight against Aljo. Risky. Because, you know, obviously Aljo would benefit enormously if, if you beat a former champion. And, um, you know, it, it it puts Alex back in the winning circle if he gets the victory. But, you know, that's a very tough guy to look good against. I don't know if I'd take that fight if I was him, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, you know, depending on what the alternatives are, that's a tough fight. I, I, I could see certainly Volkanovski doing really well. Don't get me wrong. But it's risky without a ton of upside, you know. All right. Let's get to the uh, the Super Chat. See what you got. I appreciate everyone who has joined. Thank you so much. You can like and subscribe. All right. Let's see what we got. Whoa. Got a bunch. Okay. 
from MMA Sauvage. Is this a French gentleman? I don't know. I can't believe you picked Gaethje over Max. I did too. Yeah, I am about to say most of us did. Uh, do you think Max is making a mistake of not fighting Islam and going for Ilya? The only thing I'll say about this, and he actually, did you guys see he tweeted me and I tweeted him back. The only thing I'll say about this is I know that those cuts to 145 are a little bit harder than than he and his team let on. And I don't know what's competitively best, going back and forth, or now that you just slept Justin Gaethje, do you wait for Connor at 55? Or, you know, or I know he's fighting Chandler at 170, but could they make it at 155? I mean, I, again, is that an option? Is that a thing that you can do? Do you wait to see what happens? In, with, I mean, because Armin's probably up in the bullpen, you know, and maybe they don't, right? So, like, He's in some ways he might be forced to 55 because he can't or 45, excuse me, because he can't get the title shot right away because Armin's in the queue, obviously, and, and Poirier's next. Maybe, you know, would it make sense to go to max to 170? I don't think so. So does Connor want to come down to 55? I don't know if he does anymore. So there's I mean, there's some weird the thing. I, I said this to him. If you if the Connor fight is possible at 55, I think you go for that one. I really do. I really, really, really do. I think you go for that one. Um, but if not, then I don't think there's a bigger fight he can get than the Taporia fight. And it's one of the best fights you can make in the sport. You know, but I'm just thinking about Max. What's a bigger, more lucrative fight for him potentially? Dude, a BMF fight against Connor? Like, say it out loud. Who would you favor in 2024, 2025, whatever, at 55? Holloway or, or McGregor? Dude, I favor Holloway. I favor Holloway. I think I think Max wins that fight. OG Icy, welcome to the party. Maj, welcome, Maj, welcome to the party. All right, RM, what do you make of the controversy surrounding the Poetan low blow with Herb Dean? They touched gloves after, and a good few seconds went by before the KO. I don't understand this excuse for Hill. There is no excuse for Hill. So what my understanding is Cor Daniel Cormier had kind of circulated this idea in an interview he did or a podcast he had done with Ben Askren, where he says to Ben Askren, hey, um, I spoke to Jamal Hill afterwards, and he had kind of brought this up. Now, note that Jamal Hill has not publicly brought this up. And I'm betting that he didn't tell Cormier to bring it up. I'm betting Cormier just decided he thought it was interesting to bring it up. Um, Big John got on Twitter yesterday and was like, guys, here's how this goes. It's the fighter themselves who decides how long of a break that they want. The cup got hit. He signaled to the referee he did not want a break. That is, according to the rules, his right. And so Dean walked off, and they went back, they touched hands, and then they went from there. Defend yourself at all times is my response. I mean, I've, it sucks for Jamal Hill. I, I, I certainly realize that it went poorly for him thereafter. Them's the breaks. That's how the sport goes. So Cormier being like, well, it kind of like he was, he was on a rhythm – and it's like, well, dude, if you can just foul someone to interrupt their rhythm and there's no consequence for it, that's a fucked up thing in the sport that we shouldn't allow. Anyway, I'm not saying that Jamal Hill did that, but I'm just saying if Jamal Hill accidentally did that and that's a thing where now they have to stop it and then they have to restart it somewhere else and blah, blah, blah. Why wouldn't you just ever fucking foul? Just foul. Oh, I'm feeling pressure. Foul. You know what I mean? Foul. And that would be an intentional one, but they would still be like, well, you never know, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. The fighter who was hit, according to the rules, decides they didn't want it. They touched gloves. He got finished a few seconds later. It's a, it's a, here's my response. It's a brutal fucking sport. It's a brutal fucking sport. The only thing I would say is, um, listen, I think Cormier was just kind of wondering out loud and, you know, trying to have a fun discussion point for online content he's creating. I don't, I really believe, you know, I don't know Daniel Cormier that well, but I've known him to some degree over the course of the years. He's always been very kind to me. He's always been very professional with me. I realize that there's a lot of people who have complicated feelings about his commentary. But what I would say is, um, I see this a lot on a lot of the fighter YouTubes where uh, it's a little unfair. But, you know, for example, when Connor announced months and months ago, announced, that he was coming back June 29th. It ended up being true, but like we did not have confirmation. And if you looked at all like the fighter YouTube channels, they're all like, oh, well, you know, Connor's back, blah, blah, blah. It's like, mm, that's fake news. It's not news until it's like double sourced and then there's something official behind it. 
And, and, and by the way, it wasn't official I mean, at that time. Like they actually had not signed the deal. And then you get stuff like this. It's like, I kind of feel like if you're Cormier and you actually have a public role with the organization, I 100% don't think he meant anything by it in terms of like trying to make the referee look bad. I don't think, I don't, I don't believe he did that. I really don't. But you've got to understand at this point, one, you should know the rules better than the vast majority of us do. That's kind of what comes with the job. And two, there probably is a degree of um, caution that should be exercised in introducing some of these topics that have not been thoroughly researched. You know what I mean? Like um, all of us will make that mistake time to time. But I think the complicating factor for Cormier is not personal mendacity. No. It's the role he holds within the Ultimate Fighting Championship, the public role that it is, and then you know, hey, I'm just uh, you know, I'm just having this kind of fun conversation for banter. I'm not sure you're allowed to have those kinds of conversations in that same way anymore. You know, uh, Ben Davis, the Bane, or uh, uh, you know, just the fucking hero of all heroes, gifting memberships out here. Get them while they're hot. Shouts to that guy. We got to do a show in Columbia together. He has done some down there for uh, for uh, a guy we know mutually. The T. Kogo. Hope that's not a racist name. All right. What do you make of the Oklahoma commissioning threatening punitive action against AEW for having a... Is this a real thing? Please tell me this is not a real thing. What do you make of the Oklahoma commissioning commission threatening punitive action against AEW for having a trans pro wrestler performing against women? I have heard, when I say literally nothing about this, I mean absolutely nothing about this. Um... My dad is from Oklahoma. Let me tell you about Oklahoma. Like any state, I'm sure it has some nice parts. I'm sure that it does. I've not seen them, but I am confident that they probably exist. My dad is from a place called Lawton, Oklahoma. If you were ever wondering, hey, is there a town in America that is built strictly on bail bondsmen and pawn shops? It's Lawton, Oklahoma. Uh, got got mugged there. I've told a story a million times. Like it's the land that time forgot. You know, I don't know what the story is with this or anything else, but trusting the regulatory authorities in Oklahoma under any circumstance is a very very bad idea. Is Max the new greatest Hawaiian MMA fighter? I think the case for him has changed substantially at this point. Before I was really hesitant to put him up against there against BJ. I think that there's a very I think. I think if you wanted to, you could do it justifiably. I have complicated feelings because I saw BJ's career in all of its glory, not the bad part, but I saw all the good part. And so it's a little harder for me to divorce myself from that. But I think if you wanted to now, if you really wanted to say, I think Max's career has exceeded that, um, I think you can make it. I think you can make it. Thoughts on Shogun so far? What a fucking show. What a fucking show. That show is, again, I'm only three episodes deep, so I don't know if it turns bad after this. I don't know. But thus far, I have been, dude, the amount, you know what I love? The, 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 the amount of craft that these people put into it. And by the way, like, in a world full of, like, it's not science fiction, but in a world full of just, you know, part of the reason why I don't like the, the to bring it back to Star Wars, the first three prequels is like, dude, the all the computer graphics, all the CGI to me feels so lifeless and dull. It doesn't bring any kind of spectacle to it at all to me. It bring it makes it it makes it so flat and boring. To me, it's the practical effects of the middle three and to an extent some of the latter ones that really make it so special. And you know, again, this is not sci-fi. This is not the same genre. But like again, the the level of craft in the uniforms and the dress and the sets. And the detail that they want. I mean, it is fucking outrageously good on that level. So, so far, so good, man. I'm, I've, I'm, I, I, when everyone was selling it to me, I was like, yeah, we'll see about this. And then I was watching, I was like, okay, these people were telling the truth. This show rocks. Some name I can't pronounce. Thank you for joining the membership. Ben Field, has BC been keeping you up to date on morning comm plant? I don't know what that means. Genuinely don't know what that means. Uh, okay. I was screaming at you Saturday in the chat to restart your computer. If I buy the pay-per-view on my phone, it does this until I restart my PC, F, ESPN. But, I, but see, okay, here's the problem. Once I move from here to here, I can't 
restart the computer again because then I would lose the feed. So that was the problem. If I restarted it, I would have to end the feed and start a new one. Why can't I just fucking get what I want? <laughs> right? Here's here's my thought. Why can't ESPN Plus work? And I'm not saying this as some kind of like angry media guy. I'm a fucking customer. I'm a customer. Buster, in the words of Jay-Z. Well, actually, he says it differently. But you get the idea. Uh, I'm a fucking customer. Like, I have a right to complain about this. I should be able to turn off my TV, turn on this, and it work. And it doesn't. It's so frustrating. The GOAT list is a dumb concept, but what would you say Pereira needs to surpass Habib on it? It's one of those situations, again, where Habib had a kind of a flawless run. Flawless. But uh, and Pereira hasn't, but P- Pereira's done more. I don't think he's got the time where it's even going to be a relevant question. I mean, he's 36 now, right? I could be wrong about that, but I don't think he's going to have the time for it. It's just a question of what I, I, I'm. I'm typically going to. I'm going to typically give a more weight. This will not always be true, but I'm typically going to give more weight to longevity than punctuated moments. There are exceptions to that, but. Um, if he were somehow able to have some serious longevity, then that might be interesting. We know John, John loves to do lots of tape studying his opponents. It's true. Is there a chance that because Tom's fights have been so short, John feels there isn't enough tape on Tom to fully dissect his overall game? This, you know, we have all have our own feelings about John Jones one way or the other, but he is one of the few fight. I've talked to so many fighters. Jim Miller did an interview this uh, before UFC 300. He was like, yeah, I don't really watch tape. I let my coaches watch tape. Dude, John Jones is not that way at all. He will absolutely bury himself in tape study. And I think that that speaks to him as a competitor. Again, you could say whatever you want about him. You can think whatever you want about him. I'm not telling you to change any of that. What I'm telling you is he has the psychological makeup to be able to watch tape in ways that his contemporaries do not. And it allows him, you know, significant, I think, advantage as a consequence. He doesn't get emotionally tied up in it at all. And... Um, you see the you see the result. Luke is Nunes coming out of retirement to fight Kayla, assuming Kayla eventually becomes champ. The biggest women's MMA fight the UFC can make right now or in the near future. Yes, right now that's the biggest one that they can make by far, no doubt about it. The very best to ever do it against the best judoka in American history is. I'm not saying it's like as big as Ronda versus Holly, but it's big and it's good. Just finished the O.J. Simpson Made in America docuseries. What was your feeling when his verdict was read and what was the broad opinion of the nation? I can't remember if I was in ninth or 10th grade when that decision came down. I think I was in 10th. I'd have to go back and look. I don't know if that's right. I remember uh, this was this girl in one of my science classes. I saw her in the hallway and she's like, did you hear? And I said, no. And she's like, O.J. was found not guilty. I remember being dumbfounded. I remember being like, you got to be fucking, <laughs> you got to be fucking kidding me, you know? Um, <coughs> then later on in life, when I saw the docuseries, I understand like, there's, there is no other plausible alternative in the OJ case, right? They're, they're, who else would have done it? They don't really have... Um, first of all, they have forensic evidence tying him, but beyond that, they don't really have like, what would the motive anywhere else be, right? Like you just don't have any, like he had motive. He had, there's forensic evidence tying him. There's physical capability. Like there's just no, like this idea, like, oh, it was a team of ninjas who went in there and started fucking slitting throats. Like this doesn't, it doesn't hold up. There's no, there's no plausible, um, evidence or explanation or motive in those circumstances. So he had, he had all of it. And for those reasons, I believe he should have been found guilty. However, when you do two things, one, when you retrace how ineptly the prosecution um, prosecuted that case, you realize just the significant fucking errors that they opened up. And that's one. And then two, when you see the larger history and the lack of trust that the public, in particular the African-American public, had with very good reason, again, evidence-based reason, to doubt their authenticity, to doubt their um, willingness to follow the law themselves, to doubt any number of things about their operation. 
um, you can understand how they got it a not guilty verdict. I can, I can understand. I, I don't agree with it, but like it's one of those split decisions. We're like, can I see how they got there? Yes, I can see how they got there. I can absolutely see how they got there. Mark Furman was, you know, if you grew up in LA and you heard Mark Furman, you know, the gloves don't fit. And Mark Furman is on there, N word this, N word that, and any number of other lab errors that they had committed. Barry Sheck was sort of a big, important voice in the. People forget about him. They also talk about Robert Kardashian and then Johnny Cochran. Barry Sheck was another one of those guys. Barry Sheck has actually gone on to do great work in exonerating people who have been falsely imprisoned. So he's actually one of the few guys who, since that time, I think has done. I mean, obviously, a lot of them are dead now, but since that time, actually went on to do like really valuable work. Um, but I, I get it. I get I get how he got off. I I completely get it. Doesn't mean I think he is not actually guilty. If you if you've ever sat on a jury, and every state's going to be a little bit different, but it's like, you know, do you have reasonable doubt? Did you have reasonable doubt he committed it? I don't think I would have had it, but I can understand how someone would have come to that conclusion, and I I I, there, I can totally see it. JJK, welcome to the party, player. How would you rate 300 if the BMF fight was removed from the equation? How much of 300's critical success is accredited to Holloway's performance? A huge amount. That's not, I think, you know, with Poetan doing what he did, so you could have moved up the Rackage fight or something like that, and it would have been that in the Zhuang Wai Li fight, fight. You know, give that B plus, A minus, something like that. I think what Max did is the one that put it over the top. I mean, all time UFC moment, all time. Could be number one, depending on how you rank them. So yeah, does the card take a hit if you pull out an all-time UFC moment? Of course it does. How could it not? How could it not? Uh, you're benefiting from its inclusion. But I still would have had a high opinion of that card. Absolutely. Does Yuri get the title shot after Magomed, and does Charles have a chance to get back in the title picture? Yes, on the latter. I, Yuri might have to fight one more. I don't know how the schedule is going to work. Also, is Yuri the one to beat Pereira? I think he could. I think he could. I think his chin is actually a little bit. I've always known it to be good, but I kept waiting for it to like fall off a cliff and it just doesn't, you know? So because of that, I kind of feel like, yes. Um, I just don't know. Where does he stand in the ranking? So at 205, Yuri is where? He's number one. Okay. But I, but to your point, this is the first one back. Ankalaev will probably get it next. Yeah, I think he will get it after that. Yes. And I do think he can beat Pereira. Pereira's a much better striker than him. But no question about it. But that dude's got a certain kind of something that is hard to beat. Hard to hard to overpower. Hard to beat. Have you ever read Fear and Loathing in La Liga? No. If so, what are your thoughts on Real Madrid's ties to Franco's regime in Spain? I mean, I think it's an unfortunate part of history, but I've not read that particular book. Also, it doesn't dissuade me from liking them now, if that's what you're asking. Look, I basically stopped using social media lately and I'm proud of myself, but I feel disconnected from MMA as a sport and community. Any tips to stay in the loop without socials? <coughs> as somebody who's actually not doing that, I don't know. It used to be you didn't need social media at all and that the MMA websites could carry you. Sure Dog was a big site. Mania was a big site. Bloody Elbow was a big site. Fighting Junkie, these were big sites. And Fighting and Junkie are still big sites, but like, did you guys see what happened to Stephen Morocco? Stephen Morocco got laid off. He was doing investigative reporting for MMA fighting. Like, there isn't any longer an MMA reporter doing investigative work at any of the big sites in the sport. Let me assure you, 2000, 2009 or so, that was 100% not the case. Opposite of that case. Opposite of that case. Um, they're just... There's media I, I i'm trying i'm I've, i said this before and i'll say it again and I, I i certainly hope he can land on his feet and um he's done he did some of the best work in mma that we've ever seen his his piece his piece on spencer fisher is one of the most important one of the most important articles in mma history very easy to say that one of the most important ones and he did it so i really am hoping he'll find a way to land on his feet but like straight up journalism doesn't have a future in mma it just doesn't. Straight up, like, balls and strikes, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't. It has no future. Um, and honestly, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with some of these various places and these various sites, but as media continues to disintegrate, 
I would not be surprised if in five years, one or both of the big MMA sites are no longer in business. I, I'm not declaring that to you. It's a little hard to predict exactly how this is all going to go. But, you know, again, one more time for anybody watching. And again, there's people in MMA who have currently have jobs who don't realize their jobs are already over. Guys, I said it before. I've done better than almost anybody. Not, 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 not everybody, but just about. And the job that I've been in is being eliminated. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and there isn't a natural lateral move to make. If that's happening to me, again, who's done better than not everybody, but just about everybody. Um, and you're, you haven't done as well as me. You, you have some very, very difficult questions to start asking yourself. I, I think, oh, what's going to happen to the future of MMA media? I think some of it will stay around. I think there'll be some big winners that will stick around. I don't know if I will or not. I mean, certainly that's my attempt, but you know, you just can't predict the future. But I think there's a lot of people working in MMA media today who won't be in five years, flat out. They just won't be. How does Taporia do at 55 versus the top five? Okay, top five at 55. So Islam, that'd be kind of curious. Armin, Armin might overpower him. Charles Oliveira. He's got the firepower to stand with Charles. It's just all the grappling shit I don't know about. But he might do well against Oliveira too. Gaethje. We'll have to see where Gaethje's at at this point. I don't know. Poirier. Poirier's going to have... That's going to be a tough fight. That's going to be a tough fight. I, I would favor Poirier maybe on that one. And then Gamrot. Gamrot could control him. So, see, it, the issue isn't skill so much, but size there. Connor, welcome to the party, my friend. I heard SB say that UFC was a gatekeeper to women's MMA. SB? Who's the fuck's SB? There was the want from the audience. But unfairly, women couldn't get to come and show their skills. How true is this framing? I heard SB say that UFC was a gatekeeper to women's MMA, that there was a want from the audience, but unfairly women... Yeah, uh, okay. Yes. So, dude, Gary Shaw and um, Scott Coker were putting on women's MMA before Dana White. Dana White and the UFC, they were not... This is what I mean. Like, you're looking around at MMA now, and you're looking at the PFL just kind of stumble their way through their calendar, and you're like fuck these guys what the fuck you know and then you look at bellator they couldn't even hang on anymore and you're like jesus you know and then one is one does some cool shit but they're just hemorrhaging money and you're like oh these people are just bad at promoting but what you don't understand is like that's not always been the case and there were other promoters by the way remember ufc didn't do first of all dude i i lived through the ufc getting rid of the lightweight division i remember that <laughs> I remember after Eves Edwards fought Josh Thompson and all that shit. I remember when they fought, like, yeah, we can't, we can't do shit with this weight class. And dude, how did they get 125, 135, 145? Did they scale their own operation? No, they just fucking bought out the WEC. That's how they got it. Dude, there were other promoters doing interesting shit that they were not doing for a long time. For a long time. Um, now that's not to say UFC hasn't done it better. But the first are the ones who are thinking about these things. Like, there were other promoters doing this stuff. And so there's a famous TMZ, like, you know, Dana's going in, I think, to some, like, L.A. restaurant or coming out of some L.A. restaurant. And someone asked him, like, hey, when are women going to be in the UFC? He's like, never. And then, like, not too long after that, obviously, Ronda Rousey was in. But this was a lot. You have to understand where MMA was at that time. I'm not saying I agreed with Dana because I don't. But I don't think his logic was crazy. Okay. It back when back when the UFC cared about their fighter saying like virulently homophobic shit or otherwise getting in trouble with law enforcement, and you know they would hammer him and you know really kind of shake their fist at him. This was at a time when they had to prove to the public that they had an image that they needed to uphold. Hey, we're not who you think we are. You know that guy Rich Franklin? He was a math teacher. Hey, this guy Chuck Liddell, he's got an accounting degree. Hey, you ever seen Uriah Faber? Let's trot him out. They were trying to put forward an image that, hey, we can we can be trusted. We are doing this the safe way. We're asking to be regulated. We've got real athletes here. We've got real rules. This is a real thing going, and we don't tolerate people doing drunk driving or saying outrageous shit. We don't do that. And then it, 
because they had so many concerns, and because remember this is like, I think post you know the Strike Force Nashville brawl, which I think was like fourteen or fifteen years ago, which also was just a disaster of an event for MMA at that time. Um, they were very apprehensive about okay, we've got a thing that works. People will trust this. If we start tinkering with the formula, it's going to blow it all up. I think that that was myopic in retrospect, but I actually understand at least the line of thinking that. We've got something here with Ultimate Fighting. That's what the people used to call it back then. We've got something here with Ultimate Fighting. We've got something here with MMA. It's working. Everything is growing. We don't need to take risks that could upend how all of this is seen. And there was a belief at the time, again, not necessarily fairly, that if you had women's MMA going and a woman got viciously KO'd and there was blood leaking all over her face, the things you would see on the men's side, that this would be the undoing of the sport. It was ultimately, as you can see, not true at all. But given what they had been through, while I don't agree, I'm not justifying it, I can partially understand some of the thinking there. But they were definitely not the first. Other promotions were the first. Do you ever see yourself trying psychedelics? Um, I'm not opposed to the idea, but I don't have any plans. If that makes sense. Joe Rogan is your daddy. Y'all saying the Holloway Gaethje spelled wrong. KO is goat. Next, the Masvidal knee or the Connor record 13 second kill over Aldo Sheep. Um, I am Joe Rogan said it's the greatest knockout of all time. I don't think it's the greatest knockout of all time. Like just on pure knockout terms, pure knockout terms, Emmett's KO over um Bryce Mitchell is better. Just pure knockout terms, it's better. Pretty similar, but still better. But it's not the same electric moment not even close so the combination of the two is what really makes it work does Pineda have a better shot against Jones or Aspinall Aspinall is more physical but more willing to trade yes that's probably true Jones might be more cautious yes both probably wrestle fuck Poetan but it's fun either way yeah I mean again I wouldn't favor Poetan in either of those fights but probably the Aspinall fight's a little bit more winnable do you think that the UFC insisting on the Miocic Jones fight has caused people to really underrate the Cyril win? Even Nganu may have lost the Cyril, if not with the heel hook in the fifth. Yes. Also, but dude, I mean, yes, yes, maybe they're underestimating Gan a little bit, but that was such a fucking terrible performance from him. I mean, even he knows it. I'm not even, I'm not even, I'm not even trying to be demeaning. I'm not in any way. It was so bad. And I say that because it's the elite level. And I don't mean to say that, oh, because they're fighting in the UFC. No. They're fighting for the title. Dude, there is a lot of behavior and choices fighters make that we can say is bad, but ultimately can be very forgiving depending on the context. For example, Jalen Turner, I think, made a bad decision in not following up on Moicano, but I don't think it necessarily will limit him if he works on it going forward. He could still have tremendous heights, and it wasn't the biggest bout of consequence. It was a big one, but not the biggest. Dude, this was a title fight. This was a title fight, and you're making decisions, fight IQ decisions, grappling decisions that were amateurish. That's not nearly as forgivable to me. Very, very bad. Not to say he couldn't figure it out later, but the costliness of it is so much higher, and I think, therefore, I'm not saying the disdain we have to treat it with, but the language in which we couch it needs to reflect that. One of these mistakes is much costlier than the other, and that will be a harder reputation to shake, deservedly. Oh, we went through this one already. In the 20 to 30 years from now, as MMA fighters develop and no longer specialize in a specific discipline, do you think fights will become less or more interesting to a casual fan? I'm not sure I necessarily agree with the full premise. I always think that there will be innovations and then angles you can... By the way, most MMA fighters today... They are specializing as a way to get an edge, but they're doing a lot of general training as a mechanism to start in ways that they did not do before. They would drive to one facility and then just do gi jiu-jitsu. Then they would drive to another facility and just do boxing. Then they would drive to another facility and do strength and conditioning. They would drive to another facility and do wrestling, and their coaches weren't integrated. They didn't have integrated teams. They didn't have integrated training. They don't do that kind of thing hardly anymore. They'll do a little bit of that here and there, but it's not like it was before. Training is much more all in-house, all connected, all part of a singular process. The cross-training that does happen is usually designed to create some kind of distinct advantage over their opponents. I don't really see that changing 
that much. But what I think what you have noticed is like knockouts have declined, relatively speaking, from their early days where guys just had much. I, I think knockouts will decline a little bit going forward because defense is going to get better. That's what I would say. Defense, you're already seeing it get better. That's going to make fights longer. And you're, you're still going to, I mean, the MMA is still batshit crazy. And you're still going to get, I think, plenty of knockouts. It's still going to be a chaotic sport. But when people start getting better at defense in the way that they are now, this trend continues. That is going to be the limiting factor, I think. Uh, Luke, honor of 420. What three people, dead or alive, are in your dream blunt rotation? Okay, so Bill Hicks, Patrice O'Neill. I have to think carefully about that third one. Sean Price. Sean Price. There you go. I, I don't need to have the most like, oh, it would be Napoleon and Aristotle. No, I want to laugh. I want to hear some good stories. And um, I want to have fun. So so there you go. Marijuana, leaf blower, asphyxiation. Yes, please take me. I'd be happy to die that way. How would you compare the four kings in boxing to MMA? Well, it's different because of the belt system and everything. Um, we don't have something like that currently because they were all kind of broken apart and they were building these little kingdoms, right? You know, we talk Hagler and Hearns and Duran and all that, uh, Leonard. We don't have that kind of environment right now. If we had something happening in Strike Force, if we had something happening in Pride, you'd have something a little bit closer to that. But because everyone's in house, it's hard to develop that kind of like my side of the street identity. LT, does Mark Coleman's voice sound like Alex Jones? <laughs> I don't know. I don't watch enough Alex Jones to know. I did start. I didn't finish. I, it's just too painful. Did you guys see the People versus Alex Jones, the documentary on HBO? And it, it follows the 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 families of the uh, the massacre in Connecticut um, and their court case against Jones. Jesus, dude, when they start talking about their morning, making their kids breakfast and stuff and taking them to school and all the little details that they go over, and it sounds like my mornings with my daughter, I can't I can't watch it anymore. I just can't. But, like, does he sound like him? I, I don't know. If Uncle Iov doesn't fight with the IQ of a doorknob, <laughs> do you believe he would be a favorite to beat Poetan? Yes. Yes. Just the wrestling alone would give you enough confidence, right? What's left for Alex at 205 with Ankalaev taken care of? The Yuri rematch is big. Um, you, maybe if you can do another Brazilian like Johnny Walker in, in Brazil. But other than that, I think if I were him, I'd go to heavyweight. Seriously, why not? Hi, Luke. What do you reckon as a fighter we miss the most out of their prime due to health and injuries? Dan Hardy, TJ Grant, Kane, Dominic Cruz. You missed a lot from Cruz, but he still made a lot of it. Dan Hardy still made a lot of it too, mostly. TJ Grant, you lost a lot. And Kane, you lost a lot. Those are the two big ones. TJ Grant was really doing something special when everything got derailed for him. And um, Kane's injuries and other sidelining issues, I think you, we, we lost a lot from both those guys, for sure. Just turning in, so I don't know if anyone mentioned it, but give Buckley the Missouri main event and let's move Lewis to 301 against Poetan. Deal. I'll take that deal. I will take that deal. I love that idea. Give Buckley the main event. Happy to see him in that main event. And uh, you can give the rest to Poetan. Yeah, love it. Great call. 100%. Max, next three fights. Ilya Islam, Volk 4. If he wins all three, is he the GOAT? I tell you what, man. If he wins all three of those, and that's unlikely, but if he were to win all three of those, for he, 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 that's going to change the conversation. If he does something remarkable like that, it would change the conversation. I mean, I, again, you're asking me on the spot. I, I you know, what Jones has done has been going to be hard to top, but it would change the conversation substantially. For funsies, does Connor versus Max for 55 belt sell more than Habib did? No. No, it does not. If the UFC made BMF title fights in 2005 and 10 and 15, which two guys would compete for in each of those years? 2005, assuming Penn hadn't left for K1, it would be him for sure. 2010, Vanderlei Silva. 2015, Carlos Condit. Something like that. 
Hey, Luke's 27 now, improved financially and physically, but still missed my ex from two years ago. How did you move on from a similar breakup? Damn, two years later, you're still pressed? Um, I think if you're two years after a breakup and you're still pining for somebody, you might have some issues that you need to work. And I'm not saying this like pejoratively, like you should, this is going to be my answer in a lot of cases, but you should probably talk to some kind of a therapist about something like that. And I know, oh, talk to a therapist. Yes, talk to a fucking therapist. Yes, yes. Two years pining for the same person, I'm not saying is abnormal. What I am saying is it should not go that long. If it goes that long, you've got some unresolved issue in your life that is keeping you connected to that person in that way. And you need to root out what that is. From what I've seen, Max seems like a really good guy, meaning he's down to earth, kind, loves his family, doesn't get into trouble, and has high morals. Is that the impression you get from Max as well? Yes. Now, again, I have spent time with Max off camera to a small degree. Um, I've spoken with him a bunch of times. I don't know Max Holloway super well. I know him a little bit. But from the little bit that I've seen, he lives a very different life than a lot of other people. I mean, understand something, dude. I don't think people, people, people never talk about this, but we should talk about this. Think about something. Do you think over the course of his life, through the ups and through the downs, that Max has never either thought about or at a bare minimum been recruited to join a major gym stateside? I mean, obviously he's in Hawaii, which is part of the states, but I mean the contiguous 48, right? Do you think that's true? I don't think that's true. I have a feeling that there have been people that have tried to get him to move to California or Florida or wherever. I have a feeling that they have tried, and he never has. And after the third Volk fight, I'm like, you know, maybe he probably should have gone, or maybe he should go somewhere else now, you know, like really level it up. And he never did. He stayed exactly with the same guys. And, you know, this was a big task for them to find an opportunity to be rebirthed this way. And they leveled up, all of them. Max leveled up, his team leveled up, their prep leveled up, everything leveled up. And what I'm going to say is, it's not just that he stayed loyal to Hawaii, which I find very, very admirable, but for a while there, I was like, it's going to cost him. Not only did he stay loyal to Hawaii, I think the things he's done by, by staying loyal he leveled everything up. He leveled up what it meant to be a fighter who can come from Hawaii and inspire other people. He leveled up himself, right, by like having this rebirth process post third Volkanovski loss. He made, and his coaches also contributed to their own development, but like in staying there, he made the team better. The team made themselves better. Everybody got better in the process, not just up to a certain point that it leveled off, even when you thought that leveling up was going to be the hardest it's ever been, he still did it. Now, he's not the only guy who has put Hawaiian MMA on the map. There's been other ones who have done it. It'd be one thing I'd have admiration for Max if he stayed in Hawaii and then his career cratered after the third Volkanovsky fight. But not only did he stay loyal, he made everything better around him. I have enormous respect for that. This is what I mean, man. You're just never going to hear me say a bad word about Max Max Holloway. Doesn't mean I think he can win every single fight that he is either going to be in or has been in or whatever. That's not I, I no one is invincible and I think I've said it before. I just uh, people are letting their feelings about Taporia cloud their judgment, I feel like. But putting that aside, dude, Max, I said it I said it earlier in this broadcast. I will repeat it one more time. When I say, as media and as a fan, it has been a fucking privilege to watch the career of Max Holloway, I am not in any way exaggerating a single word of that. And I know that if you're being honest with yourself out there, you feel the same. What a privilege it has been to watch his career. What a privilege. Luke, any idea if UNBC are going to be in a person in live show in the near future? Yes, that's also something. So I don't know what the plan is yet for Canelo May 4th. I, I still think that that is on. That could change because we're talking about some other plans. But 
Um, that's one that we're working on right now. So that could be one. And if we do one, we'll do a Friday show there as well in addition to our Monday show. So that would be one. So guys, there's more MK content coming. We had to get on our feet. We had to get the ball rolling. There's just so many little elements that I don't think people understand that we, I mean, even the, even the in-studio graphics and the magnets that we have to put on the wall that I've, I've shown some people, it, th it takes time for those to be fabricated and like to put up there. I mean, it just takes time. It takes time, but it, it, we're, 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 we're moving. Adam, welcome to the party. All right, here we go. Trevon, Trevon, I don't know how to pronounce that. Trevon, I don't, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. If I got your name wrong, don't kill me. Uh, Throts on Greg Doyle's comments to Caitlin Clark. Oh my God, did you guys see this? Have you encountered similar creepiness within MMA or does them being badasses stop that? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's creepy dudes who work in MMA. You should widely assume that people in, in combat sports media, not everyone, but a, a fair number of them are going to be absolute fucking dirtbags. Um, did you guys see this? I mean, she, she does this bit, like the heart, like the Yamasaki thing, and I think he did it. And uh, she was like, oh, you like that? And he was, he said something to the effect of if, if you did it more, I would, or the more you do it, I'll like it, or if keep doing it, I'll keep smiling. Some Some kind of inappropriate response about you know, his affection for her and then the symbol and then the connectedness between them. I, I, I have, okay. So I remember when he was like a national beat reporter, Greg Doyle. And then it was a big story when he went to the, I think it's the Indy star. He went to the Indianapolis star. And, um, I hadn't heard much about his coverage since then, which I don't say pejoratively. I, again, I just don't pay attention to the Colts much. I think that has been his big beat is the Colts, Colts and Pacers, obviously. Um, yeah, dude, that's like crazy inappropriate. <laughs> that's crazy inappropriate, right? Sort of this like suggestively, um, almost like do something for me talk. It's, it's so fucking wildly inappropriate, but like, have I heard me, dude, they'll let in fucking, have you seen who they let into boxing pressers? I mean, they let in the biggest jabronis you've ever seen in your life into those things so have i seen or heard similar shit yeah of course um this is hardly the only time but that was you know and especially like all eyes are on caitlin clark right now and all eyes are on women's basketball and all eyes are on this process and he goes through and what, what did he say let me get i want to get this right because i want to i don't want to fuck this up what did he what did this what does jamoke say um Okay, here, here is it from the New York Post. A second creepy exchange emerges from Caitlin Clark's press conference and involves her coach. Okay, I don't I don't know what the fuck that is. Um, all right, what did he say? Here we go. Real quick, let me do this. Doyle said before flashing the heart sign at Clark. You like that, Clark asked? I like that you're here. I like that you're here, Doyle replied. Okay, not the end of the world there. I do that in my family after every game or so, Clark said. Then he goes, well, start doing that to me and we'll get along just fine. And I know, I know, I know what some of these brain damaged jamokes are going to say. Like, oh, what's the problem there? Um, first of all, making it all about you is a bad idea. That's the first thing I'd say. Second of all, like the undercurrents of sexual tension there, you can pretend that they're not there, but they're there. And this is her moment. This is her big. This is her big debut. I think with the Indiana Fever, and just making it about that is so. I mean, just, even if it, even if there was nothing sexual about it just making it about you is the wrong call. Um, but beyond that, it's bad. I, the only thing I'll say is I, I it will be, I, I don't know if it's a fireable offense. It's a boneheaded, really bad offense. Like if one of my reporters did that and I was an editor, I'd be like, I'm pulling you off of this beat for a while. You have some fucking explaining to do. I don't know if that's like fireable offense. I mean, you could be fired for it. Um, but I don't know if that's the, the, the first thing I'd go to still ugh, bad. If Connor wins versus Chandler, all right, isn't it likely that the UFC pushes for Islam versus Connor in the fall? Yes. Would his chances be better than if when he faced Habib? No. No, I don't think so. Connor's 36, or will be 36 by that point? No. No, they will not be. Pay off all the 80 you owe him for the pay per view. I already did. I already did. Oh, no, I didn't, but I will. I also owe him for his time anyway, so. But uh, don't be a freeloading cheapskate communist. Don't worry. Don't worry. I take I take care of Othello. We've been working together for a long time, and it ain't because it's charity. Don't worry. But I, yes, I'll take care of him. 
Guys, between the $335 million suits and the 600K bonus of the blessed man forever, the UFC is still good for it, but it will come out Dana White's F it Friday fun. Is it now? It is now only once a month on Friday. Probably because when you eat processed food like that, it can cause an uh, a coronary, but people love other people eating junk food, I guess. Lemonhead, end up dead. Ice like Winnipeg, Gemstones, Flintstones. You could say I'm friends with Fred. Favorite Kill a Cam song verse. That's a good one. Um, you know what? I don't know if it's my favorite, but I was listening to um, You Gotta Love It, the, the Jay-Z diss track. He was like, you're 40 years old rocking uh, chancletas with jeans on, and you're the king of New York. This is really a very specific, specific diss. It's one of my favorites. But my favorite verse? Um, oh. What's the beginning of it? All this ice in my chain. Oh, it's good. All this ice and I'm ashamed look like lightning in the chain. Oh, wait, you know what? Hold on. I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you my favorite lyric. Hold on. I know what it is. Here we go. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Crip, peace. I swear you should come over, child. Garage, Benz, Lamborghini, Rover Fowls. Red, blue, green, like the average frog. Don't be mad at dog. Ferrari out the catalog. Bracelet switch to bangles. Medallion shit just dangle. Chain twist and tangle. You'll get ripped in mangles. Hit from angles. I told you we equipped with angels. Can't find you. Your girl tape her wrist and ankles. Show her the click clicker. Better yet, six figures. And he says a bunch of N-words, which I can't repeat. The big picture, get figures. My Knicks glitter. Get with her in the basement longer than Big Tigger. Who was a... DJ actually locally here, but then on um, BET that that verse from uh, Triple Up is like one of my all time favorites. There you go. Does Islam only lose if he decides to stay standing too long, or is that too reductive? That's a bit reductive, but it's the likeliest possibility. I feel like Dustin has better than a puncher's chance. I I mean, what you have to understand is it's not skill versus skill; it's skill decision making versus skill decision making. Islam is going to clinch and going to take him down and going to take his back. That just seems like an inevitability. So if there's a way for Dustin to prevent that, then you can get that. But short of it, you can't. Forget OJ. Do you think MJ is guilty? I'm having a rough time listening to PYT these days. Pardon? What the fuck? What are you talking about? What is? What am I not understanding? What is PYT? Someone help me out here. I'm I'm old. I'm an old man. Someone explain to me what I'm missing here. Charles is my hero. I'm heartbroken. How do you think he looked and what do you think he sh should be or would be next? Room? I don't think he looked bad. I don't think he looked bad. I think he's plateaued in terms of skill development, but I don't think he looked bad. I think he's still very capable of beating anyone in that division on any given day. It's just that what he's got in terms of the best he has to offer, they clearly have figured out some solutions to it. Um, and I don't know if he's really in the place in his career at this age to really begin to innovate a whole lot more. So it's just a question of like applying his game more readily or individual matchups. But he still can win a title. I don't find it likely, but he could do it. Why do Max's eye pokes not put an asterisk on Max's win? So what's up, Barbus? What you doing, bro? Y'all hear that? Yeah, I know. I, I, I cannot. I cannot. I, what? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Out. Out. Um, It could. Here's my view. They should have taken a point. They should have taken a point. They should have taken a point. And that's interesting because Max would still be ahead, I believe, on most of the judges' scorecards. But it would make the round five a little bit more interesting. Does Max go for the vicious KO or how does that work? Maybe he just does it anyway. But they should have taken a point after the second one. Didn't think it was on purpose. Don't care. Take it. With Ryan Garcia mirroring Antonio Brown on Twitter, is he really that burnt out or is it all to gather attention for the fight? There's no doubt in my mind that he likes the attention and the negative attention that comes with acting out like this. But it, you know what it gives me? It gives me... Um, early 2000s, or I should say late 2000s, early teens, Mayhem Miller vibes. Mayhem Miller is a very sweet person when he is in his right mind and I think, you know, under proper medical supervision and the kind of care that he needs. Um, 
But when he's not, you, he's just erratic and loud. And he was a little bit more, I think, law enforcement trouble he got into. So they're not, it's not apples to apples, but I get the same kind of vibe from him. Um, it seems to me that partly it's probably a function of drug use, but like, where does the drug use stem from? Some have suggested it's the pressure of fighting Haney. I can believe that. I think the other part is he might have some undiagnosed condition for which he actually needs some medication or some kind of help, and it's going untreated, and this is the result of that. That's my best guess. Andrew says, appreciate all your work and glad to see MK is back. Since you touched on ESPN+, Plus, where do you believe the UFC lands with the upcoming TV rights deal? I, I, uh, I... I would not be surprised if they re-signed, but ESPN's future to me is very uncertain relative to how it was five years ago. And I have a feeling that the migration, the next big migration is already happening, but it's going to happen even more. I think you're going to see sports properties leave many of the traditional television rights holders. This will be not totally true, but I think it'll be true in certain cases. Again, it's already partly true, but accelerated. And I think you're going to see them end up in big tech situations. So you've already seen PBC go to Amazon, one go to Amazon, NFL go to Amazon, MLS go to Apple. I think you're going to see that. And I would actually count Netflix as that because they're the first mover and because their scale is even bigger than Amazon's. Obviously, Netflix is not a gigantic tech company in the same way, but their reach puts them on par with something like that. I think you're going to see that. That, to me, is where I think the that's where all the money is going. The money is going into these consolidated oligopolies, oligopolies and um, and they're going to be the ones who are going to want to need the content. They're the ones whose streaming platforms are more likely to survive. I think you're, I think that migration is only going to accelerate, and so. If the UFC went to an Amazon, or again, it's not the same kind of big tech company, bought a Netflix or an Apple or something like that, or if Apple bought Disney and then it was kind of shared across both platforms, that to me is where I think the future is. Morning Complant is the strain I'm growing for MK, you lovable bastard. I don't want you to commit any crimes, but if there's a way for me to legally have some, I would love to try some. That'd be great. Thoughts on Patrice O'Neill's stance on women. I mean, listen, the guy obviously had a bunch of really retrograde ideas about women. He had a poor relationship with the, his mother, I believe, which caused any number of other poor relationships with women. I don't love everything about everything he's ever said or done or whatnot, but in terms of his pound-for-pound pound funniness overall, he's very, very difficult to top. Favorite Sean Price song? Probably Onion Head. Probably Onion Head is my number one. Will there ever be another breakout star from kickboxing like Bulacau or Poetan? Why do kickboxers become the most famous? I don't know if they are the most famous. I'd actually say that they're not. Yeah, they'll they'll be another breakout star in kickboxing, but I don't know if you're getting I don't know if they will be a breakout star until they get here from kickboxing. Kickboxing just does not appear to be something that the North American public has a big appetite for thoughts on the Yuri arena video. That was me, by the way, really thought you and BC would get a laugh out of knowing that donk took that got a pick with him outside. The it was a little much for me, just like sort of wandering around Toshiba Plaza and those kind of, if it's, if it's natively him and all that kind of shit, fine. But I I'm like, chill with that shit, bro. Do you hold Buckley's Ninja Kick KO over Max's? Again, on pure KO terms, yes. On all-time moment terms, no. Islam versus Toporia, who wins? I think Islam probably wins just based on size. I don't think he's more skillful than Toporia. Tank Davis just said Spence was high versus Crawford. Thoughts? I was going to beat Crawford, but then I got high. <laughs> um, Tank says a lot of stuff. Where was this? I doubt that he was high. I think he just got beat by a better guy. So I don't know what to say about Tank. Would I be wrong to think that it would have been fair if Charles won that split decision against Armin? No, I wouldn't agree. I think the right guy won, but it's close enough where I could understand it. Yes, I don't think that's crazy. I know it's still early, but are you getting excited for ADCC this year? Looking forward to the new MK. Not only am I excited, I want to go. 
I actually want to go. So we'll see how that works. Bro, the oh shit part of the live reaction. Oh shit, 227 in the replay. Teach me how. That was just, again, I told BC this. You can say whatever you want about me, dude. You can't say I'm not a fight fan. You just can't. Can't do it. Uh, Lydian, 84, just gifting out memberships. Go get these memberships, boys and girls. All right, here we go. Chandler must have pay-per-view points to wait this long. Not necessarily. He could just be making this decision on those terms. In fact, I doubt he's got pay-per-view points. It's possible. It's possible, but I doubt it. I think he just wants this fight as a setup to something big af- thereafter. Regarding Aljo's missing interview, Dana talked about the fight somewhat nice. What? Why? Who do you think makes the call not to interview? Is actually Dana? No, it's the head producer. The head producer there makes the call about what time they have. Because remember, it's not just, hey, this fight finished at a certain time. They might have ad inventory that they either A, didn't get to earlier in the broadcast that they have to play, plus what they have to play at certain times. So they can have ad inventory that can go anywhere but has to go somewhere, plus ad inventory that has to go at a certain time or various other production elements, and they could have been behind on schedule. We're just like, fuck it. We don't have the time anymore. Let's just go. So I don't know if it's – I don't think Dana's like, done, gave him an interview. I bet it was the head producer who was like, we don't have time. We don't have time for that. So there you go. All right, boys and girls. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Y'all are the best. Um, Remember, we'll have some kind of live stream on Friday for members only, and then I'll have one for everybody on Saturday. LukeThomasNews at gmail.com. Let me know about Patreon, what you guys think, because it's not what it's not what the output is right now, or I'm doing like one of these after pay-per-views. I could do several of these a week and put them up there, and I could really lean into that, and I could do stuff at your request. I could do boutique ones. I can do ones that you request me to do. If you're an amateur fighter, I could even do tape study for you. There's lots of different things I could do. So let me know what you think. In the meantime, youtube.com slash Luke Thomas slash join for all the stuff that's here. Love you guys. Appreciate you. And until next time, you know the drill.